Hey, what's up? Pastor Matt here from Colonial Church STA. Here at our church, we're all about loving God, loving people, loving life. And I just want to say thank you for tuning in to watch this message. I really pray it'll be empowering and helpful to you on your journey. God bless you. So glad you're here. Grateful for our church. We're moving into special days. And we're in special days. We've been preached a series called Pioneer and Vision Sunday and really believe that's what we've been doing as a church and we continue to do in our city. Uh, What we're doing has never been done here before. You can look at it and say, well, you're just doing what so many other people have done. In a sense, that's true. We're building a church, but Colonial Church has never been built before. So we're pioneering. And so thank you, church, for coming alongside us as we pioneer because we're all called to be pioneers. Amen. Did you bring your Bibles to church? Who's ready for the Word of God? You can open to John 16. John 16. Now that I'm American, I'll say John 16. In John 16 and verse 1, it says this, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is doing when he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I do not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, everybody say advantage, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I've said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What a powerful promise. What what a packed passage of Scripture about the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the promise of the Holy Spirit and your word this morning, Lord. Father, thank you that as we open your word, it speaks to us. As we lean in, as we, we engage with your word, we just thank you, Father, that it always speaks to us. It never returns void. And Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord, as we begin this new series. Father, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit's impact and power in our lives. Lord, thank you that it has the ability to change our lives, to help us form more righteous living, to become more like Jesus as we walk forward with sanctification in mind and in our spirits. Lord, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit's power in our life. Lord, I just pray for the Holy Spirit to move in this room this morning as it already is. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, Amen. Amen. I'm beginning a new series this morning, and I'm excited. It's going to run for, I don't know, a few weeks, I guess. That's what happens in a series, doesn't it? You just sort of keep going, say the same thing over and over. Just kidding! Just trying to wake you up this morning. But I'm excited about this new series. It's going to run for several weeks, and it's called Close. Called it Close because when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we are supposed to be close to the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to live closer to the Holy Spirit than we did yesterday. And I believe we can. I believe Scripture encourages us to do just that. So the series title is called Close. And um, I'm, speech, I'm speaking from John chapter 16 this morning. But when it comes to the Trinity, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit has been around for a long time. There's a lot of people who think, well, it's just Acts chapter 1 and 2 and New Testament and craziness and, you know, people moving in the Holy Spirit and all that sort of stuff. But it's actually been around for a long time. What if I told you that the very second verse in the Bible 
involves the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, was void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Look at it. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. There it is right there. The reality is this. The Spirit of God has existed forever. The Spirit of God has always existed. But God has strategically sent His Spirit into the world until Jesus came. There were moments where the Holy Spirit would come, would come upon someone, and then would leave. And it wasn't until Jesus came and He spoke in John, what we see, those words, that was when it stayed. So before that, it came and it went according to God's strategic will. Think of King Saul. King Saul is a great example. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, it says, When they came to Gebeah, behold, a group of prophets met him. Look at what it says. And the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And most people know if you went to Sunday school, or you read your Bible, what happened to Saul was kind of sad. He rebelled against the Word of God. He rebelled against um, the prophet Samuel and God's instruction. He went his own way. But look at what happens. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, so six chapters later, look at the oil here as symbolism. Oil is, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. This is the new king, David. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. In verse 14, look at it. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So it rushed upon him in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And because of things that took place and God raising up David, it says the Spirit left him. So the Spirit of God would come and would go according to what God would want it to do. But God was always pouring His Spirit out on His people. He always has been. He's always been putting His Spirit and His power into people so they can achieve what God wants them to achieve so He can fulfill His will for their lives. Anyone believe that this morning? But it wasn't until Acts chapter 1 and 2, which we're going to get to in a later part of the series, where there's the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel delivered as God's word to the people. In Joel 2 and verse 28, it says, And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Everybody say all. All. That's everyone. That's you. That's me. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Verse 29, even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Don't let anyone tell you that women can't have the Holy Spirit because it's not true. It's right there. Men and women, I will pour out my spirit. So the stage is set. And Jesus in John 14 describes it. says it like this. In John 14, a couple chapters before, He promises the Holy Spirit to the disciples. He says, this is it. What you guys know. See, the Jewish people, there's something you've got to know about the Jewish people. They know the Word of God. Especially Orthodox Jews at this time. They knew exactly what he was talking about. Or they definitely would connect the dots. He said, this is about to happen. Verse 15 of John 14 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father. Another translation say, I will pray. I I will petition the Father to send. And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Not seasonal, not temporal, not coming and going, depending upon how good you are or not good you are. Look at what it says. Forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or knows him, you will know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. What a promise. But what happens in John chapter 16, our headline passage is to the to the uh, disciples, it says they were sorrowful in heart because to them, they thought there was some kind of subtraction from their life. That Jesus, who they'd become so close to and developed this closeness to, they saw that as a loss. But what Jesus is trying to say here in John chapter 16, he's like, no, it's to your advantage. So the title of my message this morning is The Great Advantage. I'd love it if you could write that down, The Great Advantage. If there's one word I would love for you to get this morning, is, it, is the word advantage. I began to study this word because it just jumped off the page at me. I was like, man, why did he use the word advantage? I began to study the two, two words that kind of correlate and form this, this Greek word, ophelos, and make sure I get it right, the other word. Oh, yes, some pharaoh, S-U-M-P-H-E-R-O, advantage. And those two Greek words talk about the benefit. 
the, the positive nature of that word advantage. Advantage, it's good for you, it's a benefit, it's great, it's, it's, it's good, you'll, you'll, you'll move into an advantageous place. But what's interesting about that word is it goes a little deeper. It talks about cumulative advantage or increasing advantage, increasing benefit. What Jesus was saying is, says, not only will this benefit you, but it will get better and better and better. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and in tune with the Holy Spirit, we grow and we grow and we grow and we get better at walking with Him and we get better at walking with Him and we do more with Him. It's powerful, but that's what that word means. It's this, uh, an amazing advantage or profit that a believer accumulates in life by living in faith and living with the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said when he said that it's to your advantage. So this morning I want to start this series. I want to establish a few things about the Holy Spirit. I think what's happened in, in our culture and over the years is the enemy's done a great job of twisting the Holy Spirit and making it something that it's completely not. Some people, because of even generations gone before, they've taken on this context that the Holy Spirit is weird. Because someone that they knew encountered someone who was all about the Holy Spirit but was really weird. Can I just set the, the stage and, and the, set, set it all straight this morning and say those people were weird before they got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you were weird before you got the Holy Spirit. Now you're just using the Holy Spirit as an excuse. The Holy Spirit is not weird. I know the Holy Spirit. He's my best friend and he is not weird. One of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is gentleness. He's not going to shame you. He's not going to put he's not going to make you look stupid. He's called the helper, which means he's going to lift your life. He's going to lift you up. He's not going to make you look weird or be weird. The point is that person was weird. It's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> One of my favorite sayings is what gives God a bad name? Christians. So my first point this morning is this, and starting from the top down, because I really want to establish some things in our church. Our church believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's what we believe. Yeah. I don't want to sideline the Holy Spirit ever in my life. Yeah. And I know there have been times in my life and in my own Christianity where I've not consulted the Holy Spirit on something, and I regret doing that because I want the Holy Spirit's power in my life. I want the supernatural power of God to work in my life. So point number one is this, the Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is real. It actually exists. He actually exists. And He is a person. How do I know that the Holy Spirit is a person? Well, first scripture, John 16, verse 8. Jesus again is saying, saying this. He says, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. Verse 13, When the Spirit of truth comes, look at it, He will guide you into all truth, for He will speak not of His own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. He is a person. And the Holy Spirit has emotions like a person. And can I say this to you, friends? That you can't have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit if you don't have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You will never get to know the Holy Spirit personally unless you take the step to be in a personal relationship with him. I love that even the Holy Spirit has emotions. He hears. He speaks. He exerts His will. It's beautiful. And it was important to Jesus. That's why He gave it to us in such clear language in the Bible. Yeah. Point number two is this. Holy Spirit is God. Point number two, the whole, sorry, the Holy Spirit is real. Point number two, the Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. He's God. I mean, why do we do this? I don't understand. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a better understanding of it, but it's like people are cool with, God the Father, God, my Heavenly Father, you're good with that. God the Son, Jesus on the cross, resurrection power, leaving the t I'm on board with all that. Holy Spirit, I'm out. So heard something weird happened, <laughs> heard about some denomination, I heard about something, God, I'm good. No, you're not good. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life that you need. And I'm committed as a lead pastor of our church to teaching on the Holy Spirit. Correct teaching. Making sure people know. Because we need to know the Holy Spirit in our life. And we need to be in relationship with Him as well. Jesus spoke very seriously about the Holy Spirit. And it's confronting. Every time I read John, uh, Matthew 12... 
It's confronting. In verse 31, he says, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be, for, will be forgiven against people. But this blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Either in this age or in the age to come. Why would Jesus make such a big deal about blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Because he's God. And Jesus wants us to understand it's a big deal. The Holy Spirit is a big deal. Don't belittle the Holy Spirit. Don't put the Holy Spirit in a box and off to the side. The Holy Spirit is the real deal and He is God. I'd love it if you could write this down this morning. I believe this might help you just to understand or at least set the framework for this series. But the Holy Spirit is not a conduit to God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not a conduit or a channel or a pathway or a road to or, or some kind of benefit that we might get in spotty and patchy ways. He comes into our life and we've maybe done a good thing or figured out something great and then we've, we're maybe in a better place with God so the Holy Spirit is all of a sudden in our life and then goes away. The Holy Spirit's not a conduit to God. It is God. And I just love that we're invited into a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. The helper, as he's called, is divine. What if I told you that you had the opportunity in your own life to be in a personal relationship with someone that knows absolutely everything about everything? Literally everything about everything. He leads us in all truth, Scripture says. How does he know all truth? It's because he knows all truth. Because he is all truth. He's God. He knows it all. How cool is it the opportunity that we get to walk in step with the Holy Spirit who knows every single thing. He's the source of all knowledge. He's omniscient, which means all science, which science means knowledge. He's all-knowing. That's God. And the Holy Spirit is God. He's the source of all knowledge. He's a wonderful person. Who doesn't want to be in relationship with Him? That's the way I see it. I look at it from the opposite perspective. I say, why wouldn't you want to have the, relation, uh, the Holy Spirit in your life? That doesn't make sense to me. Why would you want to live without the power of the Holy Spirit? Why would you want to live or why would you want to move forward and go to that meeting you're going to go to today without the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit walking in with you? Why would you want to move forward in your career or business decision and not have the one who knows everything involved in that decision? It doesn't make sense to me. But for some reason, the enemy has done a fantastic job of taking something so good and twisting it. I think one of the ways that it's been twisted is people have started to focus in on this word called evidence. The evidence of the Holy Spirit. I prefer the word benefit. The benefit of the Holy Spirit. What are the benefits of the Holy Spirit in our life? I mean, who doesn't want to know that person? He's the smartest person you've ever met. He's the kindest person you've ever come across. He's the most holy person you'll ever interact with. He's the most willing helper you've ever come across. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. Why would we pass up the opportunity to walk in step and in tune with the Holy Spirit? The comforter, the counselor, the guide, the promise. Point number three about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is my best friend. Yeah. On this earth, naturally speaking, my best friend is my wife. Jill and I, we're best friends. We love each other. We spend all, a lot of time together and I love it. She's my best friend. But my spiritual best friend is the Holy Spirit. He's my spiritual best friend. And he can be your spiritual best friend as well, if you want him to be. The thing about the Holy Spirit that I love is he's a gentleman. Can I just say that? Maybe you've encountered people that are authority figures or might even be ladies in here today and you've met people that met a guy that hasn't been a gentleman to you. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He'll never lead you down a path that you shouldn't go down. He'll never say something to you that's not God's will. He'll never take you in a, to a place that God doesn't want you to go. He's a complete gentleman and he wants to be your best friend. In John chapter 16, I just want to break a myth this morning. Each of these uh, messages, I want to bust up a myth. Is that okay? If we do that? Okay, so in John chapter 16, this is one of the things I was talking about. The enemy's done a great job of twisting. Look at it. Jesus said this, When he comes, 
He'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin. I'm reading from the message translation. Righteousness and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin, that righteousness comes from above where I am with the Father, out of their sight and control, that judgment takes place as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convicted. See, this is the thing that the enemy's done. Is he's taken that passage, talking about sin, righteousness, and judgment, and he's tried to twist it so people see the Holy Spirit as this authority figure that's coming to tell you that your sin is overwhelming you, that your judgment, uh, sorry, your uh, righteousness is, uh, is on the table, so you have to work hard to make sure that you're in right standing with God. That's what righteousness is. It just simply is right standing with God. And the final thing the enemy wants you to do, he wants you to believe that you'll never measure up and you'll be judged. But the Holy Spirit actually wants you to believe the opposite. That's why He's supposed to be in our life. He wants you to understand and be reminded of that Jesus has paid the price for your sin. Not only has He paid the price for your sin, but because of that price that He's paid, He's automatically allowed you to be in right standing with God. The Holy Spirit wants you to be convinced of that. And the final thing is He wants you to know that you are absolutely enough. I mean, come on. How awesome is that? On the one hand, the enemy he wants you to feel condemned because of your sin. But the Holy Spirit wants you to be convinced that your sin has been taken care of by Jesus. This is good news this morning. I love it. And I would love it if this, in the coming weeks you just begin to flip the switch on the enemy. Just say it to him. Just say, I have the Holy Spirit. He's going to remind me. Jesus is taking care of my sin. I'm in right standing with God. And the Father loves me. How awesome is that? So I wanted to give us this morning five advantages of living with the Holy Spirit. Five advantages, remember that word advantage. Cumulative, building, benefit, profitable, something that grows over our lives. So the first advantage of having the Holy Spirit in my life is this, power. It's powerful living. Puts power into your faith puts power into your walk with God. It's like putting a a battery pack on you. That's a spiritual battery pack. I wrote this down and I think it's pretty good. It's a spiritual energy drink for your spiritual body. That's what it is. It puts power into your faith. It puts power into your walk with God. The Holy Spirit is intended to be your power source from heaven. It puts power into your life. And how many believers go their whole lives without engaging in the Holy Spirit and they find themselves living this powerless Christianity, completely void of the power of God in their life every single day. That's what the Holy Spirit is there to do. It's help you accomplish the Christian life the best way you can and the way that God has intended you to live. The second thing, the second advantage is this, empowerment. So you get power, but you also get equipped. The Holy Spirit is actually there to equip you. And help you live the life you're called to live. This is good preaching this morning. I hope you're engaged. There is a reason he is called the helper. Because he wants to empower you in life. He wants to help you in life. From the small decisions to the big decisions. Have you ever been in a situation where you've just felt this prompting on the inside and your heart's like, oh, I wouldn't say that right now. Or maybe you go home. This has happened to me before. You go home and the Holy Spirit says, I wouldn't say anything about that right now. Or maybe you're facing something massive in your life, maybe a new business you want to start or someone that maybe a relationship you've come into contact with and you're thinking, man, I'm going to maybe enter into a business relationship or I'm going to maybe marry this person. Big decisions as well. The Holy Spirit is there to empower you to make that decision. Why would we not want this person in our life to help us? See, the enemy's done a great job of telling you the Holy Spirit, he's going to point the finger at you. But I love the idea that the Holy Spirit's there to show us things, to help us, to show us the supernatural angle on something, to see the supernatural at work in our lives, to see the the possibility that comes with knowing God and walking out the faith life. The third benefit or advantage is comfort. Holy Spirit in my life gives me power, empowerment, but comfort I once met a uh, or I was mentored by a guy 
who met a guy that he was counseling. He was trying to get this guy to a place where he would maybe give his life to Jesus. This guy, his name is Steve. He's a pastor at Hillsong Church when I was newly saved. And I'd never really met anyone at that point who talked about the Holy Spirit the way Steve did. He talked about the Holy Spirit not in a weird way. He talked about it in an empowering way, how the Holy Spirit can actually give you a huge edge in life. And he told me about this conversation he had with this guy and he was sitting down and over coffee and trying to explain to this guy why it's important that you say yes to Jesus and you start to live for him. And this guy sort of had this worldly view and he said, yeah, I know about God. I know about God. I know all that stuff. I know about religion. But how are you any better off than me? And Steve looked him in the eye and said, the Holy Spirit. See, I know Jesus, but I also have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has filled me up, helps me live the life that I need to live, helps me understand things that maybe I can't understand, helps me move in the direction that I need to move in. That's what, plain and simple, it means to be better off. How am I better than you? Not in a prideful way. I have the Holy Spirit. You don't. And I think that's a powerful, powerful statement that we could say in our own lives, that we can call on the Holy Spirit to live the life we're called to live. But He's a comforter. That's one of His names. One of the advantages is comfort, peace, and rest. Holy Spirit has the ability to put a blanket of peace on you in a turbulent situation. Has the ability to come into your life and remind you that God is there. Remind you that God is close. Remind you that He loves you. And He hasn't walked out the door. And that's what the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is intended to do. It's to help you. The fourth advantage is conviction. Conviction. But I want you to take this word. And as your pastor, I want you to see it a different way. He wants to convince you. He wants to convince you of the goodness of God. He wants to convince you of how awesome Jesus is. He wants to convince you of your right standing in the kingdom of God. He wants to convince you that all the stuff that you did is completely washed away because of Jesus' blood. He wants to convince you and convince you and convince you. He does not want to tell you that you've done something wrong. He loves you. He wants to convince you of Jesus. I remember when I first said yes to Jesus. What did I feel in that moment? The reason that I said yes to Jesus, what did I feel? I wasn't convicted by my sin. The Holy Spirit convinced me of my need of Jesus. Yeah, that's worth clapping about. When I said yes to Jesus, it wasn't on the inside of me. I was like, man, I've done so much bad stuff. I need to make amends. But the Holy Spirit convinced me convicted me of how much I needed Jesus, how much I needed God in my life, how much I needed this Savior who hung on a cross and died apparently for me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the whole intention of having the Holy Spirit and calling on the Holy Spirit in our life. He convinces us of the things that we need to be convinced about. I believe the Holy Spirit will convince you about that person you're supposed to marry. I believe the Holy Spirit will convince you of the people you should hang out with. He's not going to make you do it, but He'll show you if it's right or if it's wrong. I believe the Holy Spirit will convince you it's time to maybe move on from that habitual sin. The Holy Spirit's never going to just sit there and say nothing if you're asking the Holy Spirit for what He has to say on the matter. But He'll convince you maybe it's time to move on. The Holy Spirit conviction is not there to condemn, it's to convince Of what? The goodness of God. I love it in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to get to that passage in Scripture in a later part of the series. But I love it in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit fell permanently on people. What did they profess in the prayer language and tongues? What What had happened in that moment? What were they saying? They were talking about the works of God, the goodness of God, how awesome God is. That's what Holy Spirit conviction does in your life. And the last thing, The last advantage of living with the Holy Spirit in your life is assurance. Assurance. I love that word, assurance. To be assured in a troubled time is powerful. To be assured generally is powerful. But what does the Holy Spirit do? It assures us of what God has done on our behalf. It assures us of things. I love our dream team. We have an amazing team in our church, great leaders and people that lead teams and oversee stuff. And one of the things, one of the attributes of our team that I just love, 
when it comes to Jill and I leading our church, they always assure us. They always give assurances. I love when, you know, maybe we're going through something with a venue or something happening. Jeremy will always come up and he'll be like, nah, it's cool, man. We're going to work it out. God's going to show up. It's going to be awesome. Service is going to go, things are going to be great. There's always that assuring word that comes from our team. And our team are amazing at it. We are surrounded by the best team. But there's that assurance that comes. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Assure you that you're saved. Assure you that Jesus did everything He needed to do for you. Assurance is so powerful. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It's Paul talking to the church. He says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. Look at verse 22. And who has also put His seal on us and given His Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That's what assurance is. It's a guarantee. He's assuring us that God loves you. He's never going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's got all the grace you need for the life you need to live. He wants to assure you. And so I just wanted to share this practical idea for us this week. I'm going to pray in a moment for people that have never encountered the Holy Spirit before. I'm going to pray for you. And I really hope that people open up their lives and just let the Holy Spirit come in. But I love it if you have received the Holy Spirit and you do know what I'm talking about. I would love it this week if you could just have this check-in mentality. Take on this idea of checking in. I think when it comes to the Holy Spirit, what we do is we just forget to check in. Checking in is just like, hey man, what's going on? How you doing? When I check in with a friend, I'm like, hey, what's up? What's going on? What's happening in your life? What's going on? What's going on in your world? I just want to check in. You know what I'm saying? Is this making sense? I would love it this week if we as a church could just begin to engage a little bit more with the Holy Spirit. Just check in with the Holy Spirit. Walking down the street, going somewhere, doing something, just check in. Hey, Holy Spirit, I love you so much. Thank you that you're in my life. I'm going down to this meeting today and I've got to go to the doctors later and just checking in. What do you got for me today? I'm here. I'm willing. I'm open. I love you. Let's just check in, church. Does that sound good? Are you with me? We're never going to grow this cumulative advantage with the Holy Spirit unless we check in. And the more we check in, I believe the more God will speak through His Spirit. The more God is going to show you things, the more that stuff's going to happen and you're going to realize, man, this is the great advantage in my life. Having the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? You received that word this morning? Oh, the Holy Spirit is the great advantage. Jesus said it's to your advantage when the Helper comes. To you, it's to your great advantage that I should go, He said. And I just think it's beautiful that we get the opportunity in our lives to encounter the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just thank You, Father. Father, we just thank You for Your Holy Spirit that You you sent Your Spirit to rest on Your people. Lord, thank You that that's happening right now, God, as we sing and as we give You glory this morning, Father. Thank You that Your Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey, Pastor Matt here. We'd love to just ask you a question. I wonder where you stand with God. I may never get the opportunity to sit down and have coffee and just talk and chat and hear about your life. But I wonder if you've ever asked Jesus to come into your heart. The Bible tells us that we actually don't have to do anything at all. But it's all about receiving something from God, which is grace. And grace comes through faith in Jesus and entering into that relationship that we can have with Him. So I want to know. Where do you stand with God? Or maybe once you did make that choice to invite Him in, but for whatever reason, you've gone your own way. You're away from God. I wonder if you would make your peace with Him right now. I would love to just lead you in a prayer in this moment right now. If you've never made that choice before or you want to make a fresh recommitment to Him, can I just encourage you to pray along with me right now? Just say this, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me and you rose again. Give me a fresh start, new beginnings. I choose today to follow you, God, for the rest of my days, to be a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I really believe if you pray that prayer, you took that step from your heart to pray that prayer and ask God in. 
I really believe he comes in because he wants to and he will change your life. Please reach out to us. We would love to pray for you. We would love to connect with you. Go to colonialchurch.life, reach out to us, and we'll do everything we can to help you in this brand new journey that you've got into everything that God's got ahead for you. God bless.